I'd like you to take your Bible this morning and turn again to Psalm 73, if you would. And uh, you know that the focus for this year is that growing like Jesus grew. And so how did Jesus grow? He grew in wisdom, he grew in stature, he grew in favor with God and in favor with man. And so we've been on the journey uh, talking about personal relationships. We've talked about, you know, how we can better take care of our bodies that God has given us as we've talked about growing in stature. And uh, now I'm preaching some sermons about drawing closer to God, drawing closer to God. The first one was dealing with prayer, or praise, excuse me, through worship and praise. Second one was about prayer, which I talked about last week, and I hope you will uh, think about those things as you think about drawing near to God and growing uh, in your relationship and your favor with God. And then today I want to talk about drawing close to God in your pain. Now, uh, some of you here today, you may say, well, that's not a very positive topic. But the fact is, is uh, as we look at the scripture, I am glad, and I hope you are too, that God is honest about life. And one of the things that you are going to experience and I am going to experience in living in this world, you can guarantee, you can write it down, you can't avoid it, is that as long as we're on planet Earth and we're in our Earth suit, you're wearing your Earth suit today, did you know that? Uh, as long as you're wearing that, you are going to inevitably experience pain. Also, as we think about this morning's worship, uh, music is a big part of it. As a matter of fact, we have two special pieces that are going to be sung today. And that's intentional because we've been drawing a lot off of the Psalms as we look at the Scriptures. And all of you know that the Psalms are the songbook of the Bible. Uh, they were written, uh, they are poetry, and they were put to music. They were used in worship. Many times you will see directions uh, for those that were leading in worship in the nation of Israel. And you'll see the directions to the leader about these particular psalms that were yours. Now, we, as far as I know, we haven't preserved any of the music, but when you look at the Hebrew, and this is the important thing to realize, they're, they're actually it was set in a poetic form. Now, because it is Hebrew, uh, it wouldn't sound the same when you translate it into English because you're not translating, you know, syllable for syllable and word and pitch and those kind of things. But uh, in Hebrew, nonetheless, many are acrostics and they may start with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then they will go through the Hebrew alphabet. And these things you can kind of study at your leisure. But you need to be aware of that. But one of the big subjects that comes up over and over again, and if you do a study of the Psalms, uh, you start out on a pretty positive note in many ways. But before long, it seems like you're spending time in the basement of emotions. And David is talking about the cries of his heart, the troubles in his life, the enemies that he's facing, how he feels sometimes, abandonment and persecution. But he turns to God in, in all of that. And so today what I want to do is, uh, is take us through uh, that, that little bit of a subject. Court can't do it all. But uh, first of all, as we think about drawing near to God in our pain, where did pain come from? And the first time that you're going to find pen, pain mentioned in the body is, uh, in the Bible, excuse me, uh, you're going to find it in relation to a statement that God made. And uh, he talks about the fact, in the day that you disobey me and you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day you'll surely die, the scripture tells us. And so pain and suffering have come to the human race because of the rebellion of Adam and Eve. And all of us are sinners by nature and choice. As a matter of fact, it is followed on later as God speaks to the woman. He says that, and some of you ladies can say amen to this. You know this by experience. It is not just something you read in the scripture. That when you have a baby, have, did any of you experience any pain? Yes, you did. I've been to the hospital. I've heard some of your screams while you're bringing this wonderful baby boy or baby girl. And I said, is that so-and-so? I've never heard her scream like that before. Um, and, uh, and, and then you also holler at your husband as well. 
What, you know, why did you do this to me? Uh, well, it's really not his fault. It's all of our fault. When we go back to the, the Garden of Eden, uh, also man was now going to be getting the fruit of the land, how? By the sweat of his brow. And there were going to be thorns, and there were going to be thistles. And how many of you have been out uh, and got poked by a thorn or a thistle lately? It hurts, doesn't it? Uh, the ground can be harsh at times. And so pain and suffering, harshness uh, has come to us, and it has come to us. Now, I will say this, that pain is not always a bad thing. Now, some of us think that pain is always a bad thing. But how many of you have been glad if you've got your hand too close to the flames on the stove? You remember gas stoves and things like that? Uh, when you start to get your flesh too close to a flame, what begins to happen? Or should happen? It begins to hurt. And, uh, and if it didn't, can you imagine it if you passed your hand through a flame and it didn't hurt? What would happen? What would be the ramifications? Or if you suddenly, you know, got your hand caught in between something and it was squeezing it, it could literally crush your hand. What tells you to take your hand out of there really, really quick? That you are suffering pain. So pain is not always a bad thing. I think we look at it that way. Uh, if you begin to feel pain in your body, like our young son did at a very early age, I think he was like 10 or 11, he said, Mommy and Daddy don't feel good. Uh, we had to get him to the hospital, didn't know it was wrong. His appendix was rupturing. And so his body told him, you're in pain, there's something wrong. And so as we think about uh, pain today, first of all, let's not get so negative about it because the Bible tells us that God can use all things for good. Would you agree? Including the pain. Now, you may be here this morning, and you uh, know that you have experienced uh, relational pain. Any married person here knows that uh, when you say I do and you start living together, that you have married a sinner and she married a bigger one. Can you say amen? And what can happen is, is that sinners tend to hurt each other in that relationship. And so uh, all of us know what it's like if you're honest. Uh, and, and some of you haven't experienced it yet, but I, I will say this. Uh, if you live long enough, you're going to find out that the reality of life is that people are going to disappoint you and let you down. Would you agree with that? That's a given. You're, you're just going to know that people are going to hurt you. But that's two-sided coin. Because not only are people going to hurt you, you are very capable and have hurt other people. You have done it with your words. You've done it with your body language. You've done it with uh, your, your actions. We hurt each other. And so we are sinners. And how many of you are grateful for the forgiveness of God? Because without the forgiveness of God, we could not mend that which is torn. And one of the great things I think about the Christian family is there is we do hurt each other. Uh, you, you, you would get hurt in any church. Why? Because there's people there. And because you're there, that's going to happen. But the wonderful thing is, is that we have, we have a remedy, don't we? We have a Savior who died for us, who paid for our sins, and we can forgive one another as in Christ God has forgiven us. And we can mend the fence. Uh, so I want you to know, and, and sometimes your pain comes to you, surprisingly enough, by just some, I hope I'm not uh, offending you, by just some dumb choices that you made. Is that true? Yeah. It's you. It's not, it's not the other. And some will come to you just through the circumstances of life that are totally out of your control that you didn't look for. Will you be surprised by events in life? Is that true? Can you say amen, Pastor? Are you, I mean, something totally takes you out of the blue. You didn't expect it. We call it being blindsided. You didn't, didn't think that would ever happen. And some things have happened with your children. And some things have happened with you or your health or your neighborhood. And you didn't expect them. You didn't count them. And they tended to hurt you. So I wanted to set the stage a little bit so we could kind of get those uh, ground rules drown, uh, down. But in all of it, uh, what is wonderful is, in our pain, which is inevitable, 
It may be that one of your children is not talking to you right now. It may be that you're at odds with your husband that you're sitting next to today. It may be uh, a financial burden that you carry, or it may be some other stress uh, this morning. Regardless of what it is, who it is, how long it's been going on, I want you to know there is a God who waits for you to draw near to him because he wants to help you. He wants to deal with your hurt. He's not surprised by it. He saw it coming before you did. And so he, he is ready to help you um, in your circumstances. So let's look at what the Word of God says this morning. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So here we have the, the, the focus scripture that we've been looking at, Psalm 73, and we have this wonderful statement that we have spent some time on as the psalm tells us. So it is good for us to draw near to God in our pain. So let's look at this uh, for just a moment. When you're hurting, and you may be hurting here this morning. As a matter of fact, you may come to church and you may be on the verge of tears this morning. Uh, we were in our Daniel playing class this morning, and one of the questions was, it was about, we were talking about focus this morning, which I think has been the best one. I want to encourage you, really, uh, I don't know of a better study or a better thing that we have done in the church than the Daniel plan. And I'm not just kidding. Uh, the things we learned about focus about our brains this morning, Dr. Daniel Amen, the research that he has done, it was phenomenal when he shared from a clinical perspective what goes on in your brain and the chemicals in your body and your thought life and your focus, what a bearing it has on your behavior. I was absolutely amazed. I said, boy, I wish the whole church could watch this. I wish the whole church could go through this. It explains so much. And I want you to know, Dr. Daniel Amen, is discovering and sharing with people what God's Word has been saying all along. And so uh, I would like you to really consider getting into the Daniel plan. And there have been some people in the church that it's not about weight loss. It's not about some diet that you're going to get in. It's going to be here tomorrow. It's about you being really spiritually and physically healthy before God so you can serve Him better and you can serve Him longer. And I want to tell you that it really works. And I'm going to spend a little time here because I want to draw you in. I want you in my class. I will teach this class again because I think it's so beneficial. I went to the doctor. Six months ago, they put me on uh, blood pressure medicine. I didn't expect that. I feel like I would never be on a medication for blood pressure for whatever reason. So I went to the doctor said, I've been watching this for a while. We're going to have to put you on blood pressure medicine. I said to him, doctor, is there anything I can do to lower my blood pressure? He said, no, it's hereditary, and you're just going to have to live with this, and it's time you need to take a baby aspirin. We need to give you this low dose of this medication. I said, is there some dietary change? How many of you don't like taking pills? Is there, I'll do anything, you know, uh, but please don't put me on medication. I don't know why. Maybe it's a sign of weakness, I feel, or something, or it's a lack of trust in God. I don't know. I'm a weird person sometimes. How about you? And so, uh, anyway, I asked him that. Uh, I, I, I got on to the Daniel plan, and no, I am not doing it every little thing that's there, but I am making some changes, and I've told you about that. I went to the doctor just two weeks ago. I uh, came in and took my blood pressure, he said, your blood pressure is lower than it's ever been recorded, and you've been with me over 20 years. Praise God. He said, not only that, he says, you've lost five pounds. I've lost seven now. He said, you look really good for your size and, and uh, of your body uh, style. It would be good if you could lose just a little bit more, and you'll be at ideal weight. And then he held my pulse, and he said, you're, it's 60 beats a minute. He said, you have an athlete's heart. That's what my heartbeat used to be, and now it's come back. Do you know how I did that? By trusting God, by changing my diet, by giving up some sugars, by eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And the amazing thing is, I actually like the stuff that I'm eating, and I would rather have it than a donut or a cookie or 
you know I have a weakness for licorice. I haven't had licorice in probably six months, and don't you make me. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I feel good. I've got energy. I get up in the morning at 4.35 o'clock. I work all day and in, into the evening, and I'm strong. And I want to just thank God. I want to praise him for what he did for me. And I want him to continue. I see people in church, you know that Bobby has stood up and said he's lost 37 pounds. Can you praise God for that? We, we got a man of God here that's lost some weight. He's feeling stronger, feeling better. Is he going to be able to serve God better and longer? Absolutely. So I want to encourage you with that. But the wonderful things that we learned about the brain this morning were amazing, just amazing. As I reflected and I thought and I said, boy, I needed to hear this a long time ago. I really did need to, to learn this a lot a long time ago. So as we think about, you know, when, when we are hurting, when you are hurting, let's look at what the, the scripture says here. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Have you ever had a broken heart? Have you ever been disappointed? Have you ever felt like someone abandoned you? Someone didn't, wasn't listening, didn't care? I want to tell you something. Not every thought you get in your mind is true. Did you know that? And sometimes we entertain thoughts we jump to conclusions, and I've seen people in their brokenheartedness and in their crushed spirit, they respond a number of different ways. Some get sad. They just plain old get sad. They get depressed when they're down, when they're hurting and suffering physically and relationally, when they feel like someone uh, for no cause harmed them in some way when someone was out to get them. And so sometimes they get sad. Others, they don't get sad, they get mad. Are you married to one who gets mad? And, uh, and they lash out with their tongue, and they say things that they regret. And some of them hang in your mind for a long, long time. And people respond, and a lot of some retaliate. They don't get mad, they get even. You just wait. And so we've got to be careful, because some also medicate themselves when they are in distress. And there's a variety of ways that people can medicate. We can be sophisticated, and we can do that with pharmaceutical drugs. And we can take more pills than we should to deal with the deep hurt that we heal in our... In our. Some of us, we can go to the refrigerator, and we can find comfort in a casserole. Amen? You know, chocolate is a woman's best friend. It used to be diamonds, but it's changed in our culture. Chocolate's cheaper. But the fact is, many will say, yeah, I just go for the chocolate bar, you know. Some of us love to console ourselves with a big bowl of ice cream. I mean, we just love that. And the fact is, is uh, at the root of it all is we just want to feel better. Some of us can do more dangerous things, like drugs and alcohol and all kinds of abusive things that deal with sensuality. And that is rampant. And it is a temptation and can lead to addiction. And really at the base of it all, we're just in pain. And we want to feel better. We want some pleasure. And we sometimes run a dangerous risk. But David here says that uh, in his life, and it's a prolific life. As you look at uh, David... Uh, you can see him as that boy who slays the giant. But you know, he had problems from his brothers from day one. When David was going to go kill Goliath, which brother stood by his side and encouraged him? Not one. They thought he was the run of the litter, that he was the show-off. He should just go home. So David obviously grew up in a home where there wasn't a lot of encouragement. David later on ends up in the... There's a guy named Saul who becomes king. And for some reason, even though he's successful on the battlefield, Saul gets it into his mind that he's an enemy, that he's after the throne. He has a great friendship with a young man named Jonathan. And because of that friendship, he said that his love for me was far greater than any woman. His faithfulness, his consistency, his standing by me no matter what was better than any woman that I could possibly know. Later on, both Saul and Jonathan lose their life. 
And David, instead of being happy, is very, very sad that the Lord's anointed had been killed. And Mount Gilboa, he buries them uh, later on after their bodies are, are taken back. And so we think about uh, these situations in his life. He knew what it was to actually, uh, you read David's life and almost in disbelief, don't you? He ends up being in the army of the Philistines for a period of time. Wasn't that the giant that he killed? Yes. As a matter of fact, his life is in danger, and at one point he acts like a madman. He frosts at the mouth like a wild animal, and the people, the Philistines, would have said, this guy's a nutcase. Get him out of here. It's an amazing story of his life. Did David have all the emotions of life? You know the story of Bathsheba and the adultery and the killing of a man named Uriah. An amazing story. But in all of it, David was a man after God's own heart. And when rebuked, when confronted what his sin, he confessed and he turned to his God. And I believe that's why he was a man after God's own heart. He knew when he was wrong. He knew when he was out of the way. And he knew enough to humble himself and turn to his God even in the worst times. Whether the troubles were created by him himself or whether by his enemies. And so as we think about our response, what do you do when you feel hurt? Do you hurt others or do you turn to God? And here is the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ to all of us. This is what Jesus said to do when we're hurting, when we're in pain, when we're suffering. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. Jesus, the Son of God, invites us to draw close, but the decision is ours. And in our pain, where will we turn but to the Lord? So important. And then when you need help, when you're hurting is one thing, but when you simply need help, this is what the Scripture tells us to do when we need help in our pain. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Notice there's a couple of things going on in this short statement. One, he is a refuge. Is A refuge is something that is an outer kind of thing. It is something that is on the outside of you. It is something to run and take shelter in. But notice he said, God is not only our refuge, our shelter, our sanctuary, that place to run to, but he is also our strength. That covers not only the outside of the believer, but the inside of the believer, that we need strength inside of ourselves. And the scripture says that he is an ever-present help in our troubles. The translation for that is instant and immediate. How many of you are glad that you don't have to get on a phone line with God and a voice will come across and say, uh, just wait on a mom moment or dial a number for immediate assistance. Have you ever gotten immediate assistance on the phone? Do you know what that means? A half an hour later, you'll make contact. This scripture verse tells us that he's an ever-present help. I mean, he says instant he is immediate. The minute that you draw to him, he will draw to you, the Bible tells us. So no waiting for our God. And he is there, especially in trouble, because he knows that trouble is a part of our life. As I was reflecting on this verse, Martin Luther happened to come up. You know, Martin Luther was a prime mover in the Protestant Reformation. His life was not easy. He wanted to get back to the Bible. Sola vitae, faith in Christ alone for salvation and the scriptures alone. And he faced persecution as a result of that stance. Some of you know that he nailed his theses to the Wittenberg door. It wasn't taken very well. And so Luther, as he looked at the scriptures, this scripture in particular, uh, Psalm 46, was something that he sat down and he penned these words. It later showed up in a Methodist hymnal in 1531. And this is the song. A mighty fortress is our God. Can you say amen? A bulwark never failing, 
Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ears prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing, doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you in pain? Are you needing help? And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word. Aren't you glad? Thank you, Jesus. Shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours, brethren, and ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Praise God. So thank God for the songbook of the Bible which stir the heart, uh, stir the heart of Martin Luther to write those words that are preserved that we could sing to God and turn to him and draw near to him and find our strength in him. This is what the scripture tells us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. He is that bulwark. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Are you here today and are you in need? If something happened in your physical body, we were in class and one of the guys said, you know, I used to be able to do this, I used to be able to do that, I've got a torn tendon, I've got an Achilles heel problem, I didn't expect this in life. Does he need help? Would it be easy for him to get depressed? Absolutely. And some of you here, but I want you to know God hasn't left you in your pain and in your suffering. God still cares about you and he has a plan for your life. He has a purpose. Some of you invested in something and the whole thing just fell apart. Didn't work out. What you thought, what you dreamed, what you hoped never came to fruition. Sometimes life goes like that. But what do you do when it happens? Where do you go? Where will you run? Where will you hide? Will you turn to the Lord? And I like this verse because it says this. Let us then approach the throne of God what grace i'm so grateful for grace aren't you i was at the baptist builders mike dravis shared the story of two incidences and one was a man who was on a boat and the boat was in a storm and it capsized he was an unbeliever he didn't love god actually he reviled god he thought christianity was for kooks but there he was found himself in water going down, he had a friend that he had grabbed onto, was holding on to him. And for the first time in his life that he could remember, he prayed. And he said, God, if you're really there and you can really help, then send me a ship. It was foggy, you couldn't see. Right after he prayed that prayer, and you'll find this in a book called God Winks. I don't know all about it, but I'm just relating the story. And strangely enough, as he began to peer in the distance, guess what he saw? A cross coming through the frog. Can you imagine? He said that cross got closer and closer. Do you know what it was? It was a ship. And it came and rescued them. And the very name, and I can't remember the name. I'm getting older, okay? What was the name? Second Chance. He said, God, give me a second chance. And guess what the name of the boat was? Second chance. I'm glad you're here because you've got to figure out the next one too. <laughs> I'm so glad it's good to have backup, you know. Another story, this lady was a believer caught in the same situation. And what was the name she asked for? If you don't know, it's okay. You got 50%. Give him a hand anyway, okay? 
And I can't remember, I should have called Mike Dravis, and he could have told me, but in this book it does tell you, she asked for a boat to come, and the name was something you wouldn't expect. And lo and behold, guess what came? A boat with that name on it. Is God good? But this is the point. One guy was a God hater. Did God help him? One woman was a God lover. Did God help her? Aren't you glad that we have a God of grace? Because grace means you don't deserve it, you don't earn it, but you get it anyway. There are some times when I turn to God for help, and I've got to admit, I think sometimes my behavior is not up to par. And I feel like I don't deserve it. And you know what? I don't. But God still helps me. Do you know why? The scripture said he's an ever-present help in the time of our trouble. Just call on him. Just draw near to him. You may have had dreams for your children. They're not going to come to pass. Where do you go with that pain in your heart? A wedding that won't come. Children that won't be born. What do you do? And I've been pastoring long enough, I've got to tell you, I've seen so much pain. When a parent comes to me and says, my uh, son or daughter came to me and announced that they're homosexual. I'm a Christian. I grew them up in church. What am I supposed to do, pastor? I feel like such a failure. What can I tell them? But do you need to turn to the Lord? You need his grace. You need his mercy. You need his word. You need his guidance. You may have circumstances that only you know in your life. Maybe you're here and the marriage never took place for you. Or maybe something happened in your body and you weren't able to have any children. It could be a million things, but it really doesn't matter because we have a God who takes care of quadzillion things if we will simply turn to him. And so God is a gracious God. So draw near to his throne. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. You married that guy, you didn't know that he was going to hit you, but he did. You married that girl, and you didn't know that she was going to take up with one of the guys in the office. You didn't know. It was a surprise. But the pain that came from the betrayal is real, and God knows. Experienced it himself and came to this world so he would know firsthand what it's like. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you. Lord, have not, never forsaken those who seek him. You know, one of the people that I really love in the Bible, and we're in the Daniel plan, and they talk about being Daniel strong. When Daniel was confronted with problems beyond his ability, what did he do? Can anybody tell me? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was unheard of what he asked. Normally, people would say, okay, bring the wise guys in, bring the wise men in, and I'm going to tell them what I'm going through, what I've been thinking, what I dreamed, and then they can give me an interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar was a hard case. And he decided in his mind, no, if they're really wise men, then they should know what my dream is. And he was that demanding. So he called all the wise men and the astrologers in his kingdom, and he says, now you come and tell me my dream and give me my interpretation. And if not, you're not going to live very long. And they responded and said, no king has ever asked anything like this. This is too difficult. We're not gods. I'm so glad that they admitted that. But Daniel heard about it. And the king was told about Daniel, this Hebrew man that had a trust in a God named Yahweh. And Daniel came. And before he came, you know what he did? He gathered his friends around. Do you remember? He said, man, we need to get on our knees and we need to seek God. I don't have an idea, even in my mind, of what the king is asking. And I believe you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they all came. And what did they do, my friends? They drew close to their God. They drew close to each other. And Daniel went to sleep that night. 
And what did the God who is an ever-present help in the time of trouble do for him? He revealed the king's dream and gave him the interpretation. And when he went to sing King Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't come and say, I got the answer. I'm the wisest, smartest guy you ever saw. You know what he said? He said, no astrologer, no diviner, no one could reveal the king's dream and its interpreted. But there is a God in heaven. And because this God, Nebuchadnezzar, wants you to know him, he has revealed your dream to me and its interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely astounded as he gave him the dream and the interpretation. If Daniel had not drawn close to God, he would have not been delivered. And it was deliverance not only for him, but all the rest of those men who claimed to be wise. You remember when Daniel was told that he couldn't pray to his God? Did he stay away from his God? He went about his custom as before, and he prayed three times a day. Certainly they would find him, and then they threw him in the, den the lion's den. But while he was there, what did he do? Was he afraid? Do you know why? In that lion's den, he drew close to his God. His fears were expelled and the lion's mouth were shut. And when the king came in the morning and inquired, Daniel, are you okay? What did he say? I'm fine. It's been good night with these kitties here, but I'm ready to get out. Drawing close to God in our prayer is a key. And last week I talked to you about drawing close to God in your prayer life. It's easier said than done when you are trying to heal. So when you are hurting, when you need help, and when you are trying to heal because you're in pain, look at what the scripture says. Oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline, me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. Oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever experienced that? Where you are physically hurting and emotionally in pain. And you know this uh, God that he called upon drew near to him, touched his body, touched his soul, touched his spirit, and renewed him. And why? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your, and let's say these words together, unfailing love. There's a story in the Bible about a young man who lived on a farm. He had a father that loved him, and he had a brother. And this young man decided that he yearned for and thirsted for a life that was a little bit more exciting. He had a little bit more involved in it. So he went to his father over and over and said, give me my inheritance now and I'm going to go and I'm going to enjoy life. And he so pestered his father that after a while, the father gave in and said, all right, son, here's your inheritance. Go. It's difficult sometimes to let people go their own way, but God will let people go their own way. So he goes into this foreign land, and the Bible says he had a ball. And he wasted his money. He had plenty of friends at the beginning, do you remember? When you got money, it attracts people. Have you ever noticed that? But when your money runs out, so do your friends. Those aren't the kind of friends to have. So he finds himself now penniless, and he, in his heart he's so hungry... And in his body, he's so hungry that he ends up on another farm. But this farmer is not so nice as his dad. And he finds himself at the bottom with no place to go. And he yearns to eat what the pigs are eating. And then a thought comes to his mind. You know what that thought is? You know, I got a father who loves me, and I got a choice to make. Either I could stay here in my pain and my suffering, 
or I can turn back to my father who loved me, who cared for me. And maybe I'll just become a servant now. I'll just become a farmhand. But they eat better than I'm eating now. And the Bible says he came to himself. Maybe you need to come to yourself today. How long will you hurt? How long will you need help until you turn and draw close to your God? How long will you medicate and save the pain in your soul before you turn to your God? And the Bible says he came to himself and he took off for his father's house. And this is the part that I like. The Bible says that the father saw him a long way off. You know what I believe? I believe that father never gave up. Can you say amen? I believe he knew what would happen to his son. And he counted on the fact that one day in his brokenness and his pain, I pray that he'll turn back to me. And he saw his son a long way off. Did he send out one of his higher hands to meet him? No, the Bible says he ran. A dignified Jewish successful farmer running across the field as his son came. And the Bible says he fell upon him. Not to beat him up. Not to chastise him. Not to say, you wasted all of our money. Look at you. I can't even call you my son. He didn't lash out. Instead, he fell about him, and the Bible said he covered him with kisses. And he took the robe off his back, and he put it on him. That's grace. That's mercy. He took his ring, his signet ring, put it on his finger, said, this is my son. And they went home, and he said, let's have a party, because my son was lost. But now he's found. He was dead to me, but now he's alive. Do you need healing from the Lord today? We have a dog. Name's Cassie. 14 years old. God bless her. I love that dog. I look forward every morning. And you know, at this age, I go from time to time and I see if she's still breathing. To see if that little chest is going up and down. That's how much she means to me. And sometimes I know at 14 for a cocker spaniel, 11 years was the absolute most we were supposed to get. Well, last night, Cassie had a little problem. You know how geriatric dogs are. And so my wife was in bed and she woke me up. And she said, something's not right. You know what that means? Well, Cassie made a little mess. Guess where she deposited it? In a very convenient place right outside the bedroom door. Watch your step, if you know what I mean. But this was an amazing thing. As I got up, I saw the mess, and the house was reeking. I looked over on Cassie's bed. I expected her to go back to sleep, but she didn't. And she was there on her bed, and she had her head up, and she was looking for me to come out that door. I could see, in even a dog's eyes, how is he going to respond to me? And what do you think I did? Somebody tell me. First of all, I cleaned up the mess, and my wife said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for doing that. That's a good thing. I'm the man of the house. I take full responsibility. I cleaned up the mess. And then I went over to my dog. And I got down on my hands and knees. I think she expected to be scolded. You know like you do when they're being paper trained and then house trained? And then when they make a mess, what do you do? You say, no, that's bad. You're not supposed to do that. But my goodness, she's 14 years old. You know, I comforted her. And I just want to ask you, in your pain 
and in your suffering, no matter how you got to where you are, if that's how I would treat my dog, how do you think God would treat you? When you come with your mess, and your mistakes, and some of it's yours, and you blew your temper, I can't even talk right. Lord, help me. Do I need his help? Absolutely. And this is what the Bible tells us. Praise be to God. Is that true? And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. When you're suffering, what do you need? Do you need somebody to point out everything that you did wrong? No. You need a little compassion. Can you say amen? But we've got a God of what? Compassion. And he's the God of all comfort. That means there's nothing I can go through. You can go through. No loss you can go through that he doesn't have comfort for. And so why not, why not draw close to him who comforts us in all our troubles? And why does he do that? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows in us. How many of you need a little comfort from the Lord? How many of you need a little compassion from your God? I want you to know he's ready and he's able to meet you when you're hurting, when you need help, and when you need healing. Now, we're going to have an invitation but this is the song, and I told you that we're going to have a little more music than maybe normal. I think that's good. We're in the Psalms. That's what it's all about. But this is a, a story, uh, or excuse me, this is a song that Laura Story wrote. And I heard this song, and I've got to tell you, I almost wept. Maybe it's because I'm a pastor and I see people dealing with pain and suffering. I'm at the hospital. I see people die too young. I see stuff happen that should never happen, and maybe I was moved by it. But if you're here today, and you are hurting, and you need help, don't gloss it over, but I want you to hear these words, and then they're going to be sung, actually, as our invitation. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family protection while we see sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. I prayed for all these things. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Could there be a purpose for your pain? Because what if our, your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love as if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea and long that we would have faith to believe. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights or what it takes to know you're near what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights or what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the achings of this life is revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? What if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, 
The hardest nights are your mercies in disguise. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, today we have been in your word, and we thank you for it, Lord, that we have a candid, true picture. And Lord, I pray for people here. My heart is burdened for people here, Lord, that are hurting today, that are needing help from you today. We went around the class today and we talked about the stresses in our life and from old to young to married and those not, I could hear the pain, the concerns, the worries that people are going through. Life is not easy, Father, but we thank you that we have help for our hurts. We thank you we have help for our needs. And we thank you that healing is available if we will just draw close to you. And we realize that was the reason you left heaven. Because, oh, Jesus, you know what it's like to be betrayed. You know what it's like to be denied. You know what it's like to be talked about. You know what it's like to be abused. There's not anything we can face that you don't know and understand. So today, by faith, we draw near to you. I pray people will find help today. And, Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus who the honest fact is they're sinners, they're rebellious, they turn away from you many times, and they have heard your invitation to draw close many, many times. How I pray today will be the day that they will make the turn like the prodigal son and just come home. And you'll put a robe on their back and a ring on their finger, and you will call them son or daughter through Jesus. So I pray, Father, that they will repent of their sin and selfishness and turn to you and open their heart and say, Oh, God, forgive me. I believe Jesus died and rose again. I trust him, not only with my time, but eternity. Save me, forgive me, make me your son, make me your daughter today because I'm coming home. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.